said Johnny can't write. In the mid-70s, national newspapers decried nation becoming illiterate, student skills decline unequaled in history. Justified or not, we were in the midst of the great American writing crisis. The flagship of the reported crisis was, of course, Newsweek's Why Johnny Can't Write. Hitting newsstands December 8, 1975, the cover story by general editor Merrill Shields reached over two million readers nationwide. As the national conversation on writing campaign is trying to change the headline, I think it's important to look back at how Newsweek told a story of Johnny's writing that put fear in the hearts of readers and is held fast to the national imagination. The impact of why Johnny can't write begins with its cover shot of Johnny attempting to write and failing. This Johnny, white, middle class, presumably a future leader of American government and industry, can't write, and it's stamped unavoidably across his chest. The textual and visual argument is really that Johnny can't write. Why is not really the focus here. The opening sentences of why Johnny can't write are clear then on just how frightened we should be. If your children are attending college, the chances are that when they graduate, they will be unable to write ordinary, expository English with any real degree of structure and lucidity. If they are in high school and planning to attend college, the chances are less than even that they will be able to write English at the minimal college level when they get there. If they are not planning to attend college, their skills in writing English may not even qualify them for secretarial or clerical work. And if they are attending elementary school, they are almost certainly not being given the kind of required reading material, much less writing instruction, that might make it possible for them eventually to write comprehensible English. Willy-nilly, the U.S. educational system is spawning a generation of semi-literates. There's no doubt of it, said Mr. Curtis one day, that one of the great, greatest factors in the test is for a young fellow to learn the thrift, thrift and learn it in his early state. And to support the idea that none of our Johnnies can write ordinary, expository, comprehensible, basic English, we are given four examples of Johnny's poor writing. The writing context is not identified. Johnny's writing is not to be read on its own terms. It is to be read solely within the context of the article. Johnny can't write. It's obvious, in our modern world of today, there's a lot of impreciseness in expressing thoughts we have. My famous person whom I admire the most is John Wayne. He's a famous person in many people's eyes of America. The old bridge was a swing bridge, and it was a real old bridge. The boards was rotten in the bridge, and you could see right through the bridge, and some places the board was missing. But it is the last sample that gives the most pause. John F. Kennedy, if he had not been shot, he would be president now, and in World War II, he was a hero in the war, and he had a lot of nanny, and a nice family, and his wife was very nice, and when I die, I would like to be buried in a plek like that. I think we can agree this piece, excerpt, full essay, we simply don't know, demonstrates far beyond the others the claimed failing mechanics and sentence structure of our nation's youth. However, it's worth considering the idea that Newsweek doesn't see the real threat embedded in this one excerpt, but in all the excerpts writ equally large above the title. Newsweek has presented four smoking guns, four ways to make us very afraid of this one thing. If these Johnnies are our future America, what future does America have? With a no confidence vote in Johnny's teachers, Why Johnny Can't Write ends with a call to the cultured literates, an excerpt from Alice in Wonderland, a dialogue between Alice and Humpty Dumpty, where Humpty argues stubbornly that words can mean whatever Humpty wants them to mean. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. Alice is to be seen as the reasoned voice of Newsweek, arguing that certainly such a thing as making words mean anything one wants should not be possible. To say that such a thing is possible is to be the threat to language and society why Johnny Can't Write is so afraid of. The final word of the Alice excerpt and of Newsweek's article is Humpty's haunting refrain. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be master? 
That's all. The end of the article suggests that Johnny, who cannot be trusted with language, will be the master anyway. popular arguments dredge up powerful fear about Johnny's writing, the academic response is often dismissive of the alarm. As former NCTE President Walker Gibson said at the time, we scoff at the idea of crisis, particularly sudden crisis. Yet the idea of crisis that fuels the why Johnny can't write conversation is formidable. That one article reached more people than a full year's batch of all our professional publications combined. The national conversation on writing may help to get us out of the problem of conversations we want to have by pushing the idea that writing and how we talk about writing really could be a collective national project of academics and the public, writing teachers and others. Fact is, we can't ignore the fear that sustains the why Johnny can't write conversation, yet we can't afford for why Johnny can't write to be the only kind of conversation we have about writing. Steeped in celebration that everyone is a writer and setting up shop on the web, the national conversation on writing may not conquer why Johnny can't write and its legacy, but it is the start of perhaps better listening and certainly different talking. And in the end, the national conversation on writing and why Johnny can't write actually have one important thing in common, believing there is something at stake in how we think about writing.